on February the 26th of 2022. English women Supreet Dillon and Temidaya Owe traveled from London to the Luton home of father of six, Saul Murray. The latter had been talking with Dillon on Instagram and then WhatsApp before agreeing to meet at his apartment. 26-year-old Dylan and Owe, aged 21, were captured entering the property with Murray shortly before midnight. They were reported to have had relations with the man before discreetly drugging him with the sedative GHB, which they'd placed into his drink. The women failed to knock him out, however, and Owe was recorded leaving the property at around 2.30 a.m. She returned with two men later identified as Ikim Afia and Cleon Brown. All four suspects left the property around 20 minutes later and CCTV showed that Afia was carrying a large knife. In the immediate aftermath, 33-year-old Murray was seen running towards the door before he collapsed. His lifeless body was found the following day and the post-mortem examination revealed the cause of death as heavy bleeding from a stab wound which had severed an artery. An investigation into the murder was launched and it would emerge that Dylan had concocted a plan to rob the victim after she'd seen him flaunting his wealth and Rolex watches, which later turned out to be fake on social media. When drugging him failed, Orway went to get their accomplices and Afia fatally stabbed the man. The incident would be referred to in the media as the Honey Trap murder and the four accomplices were subsequently arrested. Dylan made headlines in the aftermath when she was captured, lying to her young son during a jailhouse phone call. With the moment featured in an episode of 24 Hours in Police Custody, Dylan told the child that she would be home in a few weeks and that she had to sort some matters out with the police. When asked if she was a suspect, the woman said, no, they got that wrong. I'm helping them with it. I'm just helping them. That's not true, okay? She and the others were found guilty following a trial at Luton Crown Court. Afia was sentenced to life with a minimum of 25 years served after he was convicted of murder and Brown was jailed for 11 years for manslaughter. Dylan and Awe were sentenced to 11 and 7 years respectively for manslaughter. All four of the defendants were also given lengthy sentences for conspiracy to commit robbery, meant to run concurrently with their other sentences. Number 8. Mehmet Hassan On March the 24th of 2014, the family of Mehmet Hassan contacted law enforcement after they hadn't heard from him and officers consequently performed a welfare check at his home in Islington, North London. They forced entry into the residence and found 56-year-old Hassan dead in his bedroom with his legs bound. Hassan was a professional poker player who was prolific in his trade, having previously earned up to £15,000 at one time. He reportedly had a habit of keeping his winnings inside his apartment instead of using bank accounts. Prior to his death, he was dating a model whom he knew as Rachel, but whose real name was Leone Granger, a 25-year-old care assistant. On the night of his death, they'd gone to the Nobu restaurant in Mayfair prior to heading to the Palm Beach Casino, where Hassan gave his date a £1,000 with which to gamble. Later in the night, they went to his apartment. Granger made an excuse and left the home, but before doing so, she let in her actual boyfriend, 28-year-old Chiron Jackson and his associate Nicholas Chandler, aged 29. The duo bound Hassan then kicked and stomped his body until he was dead. They inflicted more than 12 separate injuries to his head and broke all the ribs on one side of his body, potentially causing the victim to drown in his blood. By then, Granger had left the area in a taxi and the driver would subsequently tell law enforcement that he'd seen her writing on her phone phrases like, don't tell me the money's not there, I saw it. It would emerge that in January and February of 2014, Jackson and Chandler had carried out moderately successful armed raids at the same South Kensington casino. The victims were tied up and subjected to violence. Granger, her boyfriend and Chandler were arrested in the aftermath. 
Clips played in court showed CCTV footage from the casino robberies, as well as a video of the trio celebrating with what was reported as the money they'd stolen from Hassan. Granger was laughing as they were throwing bills around and Jackson, who was wearing a gas mask, was seen shoving a wad of bills into his underwear. In April of 2015, Jackson and Chanda were jailed for a combined total of over 100 years in concurrent sentences for Hassan's murder and charges stemming from the previous casino robberies. The fatal attack on the gambler was described by the sentencing judge as pitiless and wicked and as being motivated by pure greed. Granger admitted to luring Hassan, which she claimed was a consequence of her love for Jackson as she fell in with his desires. She denied having known that the man was going to be killed. The judge, however, told Granger, without your willing participation in ensnaring Mr. Hassan, his death would simply not have taken place. The woman was ultimately sentenced to 16 years for manslaughter. Number 7. Vishal Gohel On the evening of January the 23rd of 2022, a neighbor of 44-year-old Englishman Vishal Gohel noticed that the front to the man's home in Bushy, Hertfordshire, had been left ajar and that his kitchen light was on. The neighbor entered the apartment and made the horrifying discovery of Gohel's dead body on the bedroom floor with gaffer tape on the lower part of his face. He had been severely beaten. A medical examination would reveal that he'd succumbed to brain damage while his voice box had been fractured via compression to the neck. It would emerge that he'd been the victim of a honey trap plot. After making contact with 22-year-old Yali Georgia Bruce Annan on Craigslist on January the 22nd. She, along with Faith Hoppy and Tiana Edwards Hancock, both in their early 20s, reportedly expressed a desire to have relations with the man. Gohel was recorded on CCTV at a store near his home at around 10 p.m., where he bought alcohol, soda, cigarettes, and contraceptive devices. The women left Barkin in a cab and arrived in Bushy at around 1 a.m. After gaining access to Gohel's home, the women let in their male accomplices, Sakine Gordon, Brandon Brown, and Tevin Leslie, who pulled up in the area in the latter's Audi at around 2.30 a.m. They entered the apartment and beat Gohel beyond recognition before making off with his iWatch, iPhone, and 200 pound cash. The victim was either dead or dying when the suspects left, and they'd made no attempts to get him help. Updates from the summer of 2023 indicated that Leslie, Gordon, and Bruce Annan had been convicted of murder while Hoppy and Brown were found guilty of manslaughter with all five defendants facing additional charges of conspiracy to rob. Number 6. Viviana Lelaine Bruno In the spring of 2019, Texas woman Viviana Lelaine Bruno talked to a man on Snapchat and arranged to pick him up for a date at around midnight on April the 4th. Bruno drove to a stone oak park in San Antonio, where she told her date that they would get intimate. Upon reaching their destination and parking the car, 20-year-old Bruno claimed she was going to retrieve a contraceptive device from the trunk. In the moments that followed, two men ambushed her unnamed date. They pulled him out of the car and one of them started beating him with brass knuckles while the other had a shotgun aimed at him. The victim would later recount that Bruno remained in the driver's seat and had virtually no reaction to the men robbing him of his keys and cell phone. It would emerge that Bruno and the victim had met up before and she knew where he lived. After the robbers fled, the battered man got help from a resident near the park. When he got home, the victim discovered that cash had been stolen from his bedroom and, upon reviewing surveillance footage, saw a man entering his residence. After reporting the robbery to law enforcement, he picked Bruno out of a photo lineup. She was arrested on a charge of aggravated robbery, a first-degree felony. It wasn't made immediately clear if her accomplices had been apprehended. Number 5. Stefania Tanika In November of 2021, Romanian national Stefania Tanika, aged 40, was arrested at Luton Airport in England as she was trying to leave the country while she was wanted in connection to a series of thefts 
40-year-old Tanika, who was pictured weeping in her booking photo, was part of a gang that had come to be known as the Rolex Rippers. The crew was believed to include mostly Eastern European women. Their MO consisted of them pairing up and approaching men of a certain age who wore designer watches on their exposed wrists. The thieves carried clipboards and typically pretended to be associated with charities or conducting research. They then hugged the men at the end of their interaction and in the process removed their watches. Roughly 30 nearly identical thefts had occurred in southern England in 2021, and Tanika was linked to two incidents. On January the 3rd of 2021, Simon Kelly was stopped by Tanika and an accomplice near the Alderley Edge Golf Club in Cheshire. The duo moved to hug and kiss him while trying to slip his £10,000 Rolex Submariner watch off his wrist. Kelly realized what was happening, pulled back and pushed the women away. Tanika and her criminal associate gave up and while the former was confirmed by law enforcement as the culprit, investigators were unable to track her down at the time. Tanika repeated the scheme on May the 30th near the exclusive Parkstone Golf Club in Poole, Dorset. She embraced an unnamed 75-year-old man and tried to get him to touch her by grabbing his arm. The pensioner retreated and only after seeing Tanika get into a nearby car did he realize his Rolex Submariner watch was missing. The timepiece was never recovered and the Romanian woman was identified as the person responsible via CCTV footage captured from a nearby property. In the aftermath of her arrest, Tanika pleaded guilty to robbery and attempted robbery and was jailed for 40 months at Chester Crown Court. Number 4. Robert Reichel On July the 16th of 2013, Robert Reichel was lured to the rooftop of a building on 4th Avenue near 47th Street in Brooklyn, New York City by two women who promised that they would have relations with him. They'd been drinking together at a local bar. Upon reaching the top of the building with the women, one of whom was identified as 23-year-old Glenis Reyes, Reichel was set upon by three men. It would emerge that they'd been associates of Reyes and her friend, together with whom they'd concocted a honey trap plot to rob 50-year-old Reichel. The trio was named as Ruben Santiago, Keston Jones and Randy Ortiz, all of whom were in their 20s. Santiago was captured on surveillance footage spraying an unknown substance, believed to be mace, into Reichel's face. The robbers made off with a few thousand dollars in cash as well as Reichel's iPhone, leaving him alone in the dark. The man was seen on CCTV stumbling towards the four-story building's edge. Roughly two hours after the mace attack, he fell to his death onto the pavement below. Santiago and Jones were subsequently arrested and charged with second-degree murder and robbery. However, they were ultimately cleared of the former charge in the spring of 2015 after a Brooklyn judge considered the prosecutors had failed to prove that the aerosol spray had contributed to Reichel's death. The judge noted that the door to the roof had been cracked open and that Reichel had never yelled for help. The judge also pointed to the medical examiner's testimony that the man could have lost his balance and fallen from the rooftop due to sheer intoxication as he was over three times the legal driving limit on the night. Number 3. Jessica Hollins Leading up to March of 2020, Australian woman Jessica Hollins, aged 25, struck up a conversation online with a 46-year-old disabled man she'd met through her former partner. She agreed to have intercourse with the man in exchange for $500, adding, we'll have some drinks and have a spa and have a good time. The man booked a room for them at the Oceanfront Motel at the entrance on New South Wales's central coast. After they'd met at the hotel, Hollins then asked the man that they go down to the beach. As they were walking, a mysterious man began following them and burst into a sprint towards Hollins' date, who was a one-legged amputee. The stranger attempted to suck a punch the victim but fell over and landed on his back. The victim pleaded for Hollins' help, unaware that the attacker was her accomplice in a honey trap scheme to rob him. The disabled man was beaten into surrendering his phone and wallet. Hollins then went back to the hotel room he'd rented and pilfered two bottles of alcohol along with some of the man's clothes. A week later, she was arrested but reportedly refused to give up her accomplice. In the fall of 2020, she pleaded guilty to robbery in company and breaking and entering. 
Today's topic was requested by River Parish. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Christopher Stanley Welsh woman Gemma Frost of Rogerstone, Newport, met Christopher Stanley on a date in sight in May of 2020. During their conversations, Frost, who was at the time in her early 20s, had asked Stanley to loan her £210, which he agreed. The man was pressed further by his love interest to also give money to one of her friends, which he refused. Upon learning that the man had life savings, Frost, along with two male accomplices, hatched a plot to kidnap and rob him. Frost picked Stanley up for a face-to-face -face date on June the 3rd. He climbed into the passenger seat of her vehicle, which Frost then drove toward Manor Way in Cardiff. While at a junction, the pair spotted two men about whom Frost was reported to have said to Stanley, they looked dodgy. Both had their faces covered, one with a surgical mask, and the other with a piece of fabric. Stanley was reportedly surprised when Frost steered towards the men, pulled up alongside them, and turned off her engine. The men opened the passenger door, telling Stanley, Get back. We will kill you. We're going to hurt you. They tried forcing him to the rear of the vehicle, but the victim broke free and was able to escape. He then saw the men get into the car and Frost speed off. CCTV footage traced the vehicle to a Fearwater address before it stopped at the woman's home in Chorley Close. Stanley later received a call from her and noticed that Frost was suspiciously unperturbed by the incident. She was arrested the following day. Frost gave up the names of her accomplices, but the police found that there wasn't enough evidence to charge them. She, on the other hand, pleaded guilty to conspiracy to kidnap and stated that she was thoroughly ashamed of her actions. Frost blamed her actions on a low point in her life and on hanging around with older individuals with significant criminal backgrounds. The woman maintained that she'd been pressured into the honey trap plot by the two men. She was sentenced to 18 months in prison, suspended for 18 months, in addition to being ordered to a 15-day rehabilitation activity requirement of 15 days and 150 hours unpaid work. We'll be lining up part two of our compilation on the most toxic relationships right after number one. Stick around if you feel like binging on a little more, they will kill you today. Number 1. Shannon Rule In June of 2022, English woman Shannon Rule, aged 21, messaged a love interest and asked him to meet her in Morden, South London. It wasn't clear if the unnamed man in question was a former partner or if she was still dating him at the time. Rule was also in a relationship with 22-year-old Daniel Gordon who became extremely jealous upon becoming aware of the other man. He started sending him threatening texts. Determined to save her relationship with Gordon, Rule agreed to lure her other lover outside a Sainsbury supermarket on Central Road in Morden, under the guise that she would come alone to discuss the situation. She was, however, joined by Gordon, who was captured on CCTV lying in wait in a hiding spot as Rule went to meet the other man in the street. At around 2 p.m. on June the 22nd, when the latter appeared, Gordon burst from his hiding spot and shot him multiple times. He and Rule then fled but got lost during their escape attempt and ended back at the crime scene, where they were met by police officers and taken into custody. The victim survived the shooting but was left wheelchair-bound and unable to fully care for himself. Gordon admitted the attempted murder charge and was jailed for 27 years, while Rule was convicted at a trial and given a 30-year sentence. In 2019, a woman and her daughter were left homeless after her psycho ex burned down their home in Red Ruth, Cornwall, England. Charlene Clark and Zach Rodder, both in their early 30s, had a child together during a relationship which had lasted roughly 15 years. In March, Rodder left Clark for another woman. It was an unexpected move which Clark claimed had left her heartbroken. Only a few weeks had passed before Rodder tried getting back together with Clark, but she stood her ground and refused to accept reconciliation. Rodder, however, wouldn't leave the family home, pointing to his name also being on the mortgage. One night, Rodder and Clark attended a family memorial at a friend's house. Rodder got intoxicated and asked that Clark return home with him, which she declined to do. Enraged, he got back to their house and set fire to a mattress. He then sent Clark a series of threatening messages, one of which read, 
Look, see the light? I warned you. Rodder went to a pub where he told other patrons that he'd started a fire which grew out of control. Not only had the blaze ravaged Clark's home, but it also expanded to three other terraced houses, prompting their occupants to flee for their lives. A disabled woman in one of the burning homes was only rescued because her caregiver was at the address at the time. In the aftermath, the insurance company refused Clark a payout because Rodder was the policyholder. Even though the fire had gutted the homes, no one was seriously hurt and Rodder was sentenced to six years in prison. Number 6. Karina Vanessa Corbalan In March of 2020, a Florida Instagram model was arrested for fatally shooting her ex-boyfriend outside his Hylia home. 23-year-old Karina Vanessa Corbalan and Alejandro Sanchez, aged 28, had had a troubled relationship and, according to neighbors, were no longer together at the time of the shooting. Corbalan's popular Instagram page showed the blonde influencer posing in the foreground of several exotic locations, but featured no photos of Sanchez, an argument the nature of which remains uncertain erupted between them and culminated with Corbalan shooting at Sanchez 15 times. Five of the bullets struck him in the chest. The victim's mother was at the scene and she was heard screaming at Corbalan that she'd killed her son. Corbalan in turn presumably not realizing the damage she'd done was reported to have called out to her ex, wake up, wake up Alex. Officers arrived to the scene and found her kneeling over his body as well as a black Mercedes, the windshield of which was riddled with bullets. Sanchez was airlifted to Jackson Memorial Hospital where he was pronounced dead. Corbalan made her first court appearance in a vest designed to deter self-harm and was ordered to be held without bail. Number 5. Stephen Booth In May of 2021, a builder from Manchester, England murdered his ex-wife with an axe, then called the police to come and arrest him. Stephen and Susan Booth, both in their 60s, had separated three years prior. Up to that point, They'd shared a home in Shaw near Oldham, which Stephen had had a significant role in building. The divorce proceedings were being finalized, and the marital home was proposed for sale at over $620,000. Susan had asked for half of the money, which enraged Stephen, as he felt that she didn't deserve it. Stephen, who hadn't talked directly to his ex for two years, was out walking his dog when a solicitor told him that the sale would be completed in three days' time. It was at that point that he started plotting Susan's murder. On May the 4th, he lay in wait at the home until she returned from a shift at the Royal Oldham Hospital. He struck her from behind with an axe and then continued his gruesome attack, ultimately inflicting 19 axe strikes, most of them to the head. Susan sustained devastating injuries and was pronounced dead shortly after being rushed to the hospital, where she worked. Stephen called the police and told the operator that he'd just killed his wife and that officers should be sent to his home address to arrest him. He pled guilty to murder and was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 22 and a half years served, meaning that he was likely to die behind bars. Number 4. Samantha Mears In 2019, a woman was sentenced to 20 years in a mental health facility for a 2018 incident in which she'd forced her ex-boyfriend to have intercourse with her while threatening him with a machete. Montana woman Samantha Mears broke into her ex-boyfriend's home while he was out at a gas station. When the unnamed victim entered the bedroom, she approached him from behind, pressed the blade to his throat, then ordered him to remove his clothes and get on the bed. She then climbed on top of him and they had intercourse, with Mears reportedly biting the victim's arm in the process. The man would later tell the authorities he'd felt forced to comply with his ex's demands for fear of being killed. After the deed was done, Mears reportedly swung the machete around and deliberately urinated on the bed. The victim was able to escape out the back door as his sister arrived home. When interviewed by the police, Mears claimed that their relations hadn't been abusive but reportedly became incoherent in her answers. She was charged with intercourse without consent as well as aggravated burglary, assault with a weapon and unlawful restraint before eventually being deemed unfit to stand trial. Number 3. Patricia Isidore and Junior Francis in June of 2018, a woman was seen driving down a Florida highway at around 70 miles per hour, with her ex-boyfriend clinging to the hood of her car. 24-year-old Patricia Isidore and Junior Francis had broken up about eight months prior, but were still living together. Isidore was getting ready to drive and pick up their daughter. Francis, who didn't want her to go because he also needed the car, launched his body onto the vehicle's hood. As Isidore would later tell officers, she didn't want to deal with any foolishness, so she just kept driving. 
The video of him holding on for his life on the highway, initially shared on Twitter, subsequently became viral. While clinging to the hood with one hand, Francis used the other to call the authorities, convinced he was going to die. He survived the hellish ride, largely unharmed while Isidore was charged with culpable negligence, a misdemeanor, and was bonded out. Number 2. Bonita Vivian Cue In June of 2021, Bonita Vivian Cue was arrested for the premeditated and brutal killing of her ex-husband, Kerry Michael Rooney, at his new market home in Brisbane, Australia. A witness had filmed the moment that neighbors rushed to help 51-year-old Rooney as he was lying in a pool of his own blood in the middle of the street. Kuwe, aged 53, had been monitoring Rooney's habits in the weeks leading up to the horrific attack. She went to his apartment, armed with two knives, a bottle of bleach, and the toy replica of a gun. She waited in the staircase of his building and ambushed the father of one when he returned home. Kuwe sprayed him in the face with the bleach and, as he turned around, stabbed him in the back and slit his throat. She continued to slash and stab Rooney as he ran down the street, screaming for help. One of the knives was reportedly still lodged in his body when the police arrived at the scene. Kuwe used the toy gun to deter bystanders from intervening, including a neighbor who'd sought to confront her with a baseball bat. Following her arrest, she'd allegedly told officers that she didn't want to pay child support anymore. Her trial is ongoing, but Kuwe refused legal representation, claiming she couldn't afford it, even after being told that it could be provided at no charge. She tried to claim self-defense, but detectives assigned to her case reported that there was no evidence of it. Number 1. Joseph Oberhansley In December of 1998, in a meth-fueled jealous rage, Utah man Joseph Oberhansley gunned down his teenage girlfriend. He proceeded to shoot his mother, who survived and then fired at his sister, but missed. In a bid to end his life, Oberhansley tucked the gun under his chin and pulled the trigger. He didn't die with the bullet instead becoming lodged in his head, effectively giving him a partial lobotomy, the part of his brain that was affected by the gunshot controls emotions, personality, decision-making and self-control. He ultimately pled guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Oberhandley would later tell a parole board that he regretted killing his girlfriend and that having a bullet in his frontal lobe had made him calmer. However, according to his family members, it turned him into a monster and they noted increasingly obsessive behavior. Even though some of his relatives insisted that Oberhansley remained locked up, he was paroled in 2012 and transferred to Indiana. In 2015, he started dating 46-year-old Tammy Jo Blanton, who was 13 years his senior. Oberhansley was vague about his past, but Blanton eventually learned the truth which, in the context of his controlling behavior, caused her to fear him. She ended their relationship and asked her father to change the locks of her home. In the early hours of September the 11th of 2014, Blanton called the police claiming that her ex-boyfriend was trying to break into her house. Officers arrived at the address and confronted Oberhansley, who agreed to leave. Later in the day, the police went to check on Blanton again after she hadn't shown up for work. There were signs of forced entry at her home and Oberhansley answered the door claiming she wasn't home. Officers searched him and found a knife in his pocket, covered in blood and hair. In the bathtub, they discovered Blanton's mutilated body under a camping tent. She'd been beaten, stabbed and cut open with an electric saw. Parts of her lungs, heart and brain had been extracted and cooked in a skillet. Oberhansley admitted to officers at the scene that he'd killed and eaten part of his ex, but subsequently changed his story, claiming he was being framed by two intruders. He made a series of bizarre statements, which included him being able to hear Blanton's thoughts and complained of a tingling in his head, telling interviewing officers, I'm like electrifying right now. Oberhansley was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 7. Jessica Strom In October of 2014, Wisconsin man John Shellfeffer, then in his early 50s, told a media outlet that he still loved his former fiance, even though she'd allegedly tried to have him killed. He and Jessica Strom had met seven years prior at a bar where she was waiting tables. They were both divorcees and a romantic relationship developed. It was turbulent at times, but it endured as Strom and her children eventually moved in with Shell Pfeffer. Over the course of their relationship, both had accused each other of being abusive. Strom filed a restraining order against Shell Pfeffer, while he reported that her violence towards him ranged from punches to stomping on his foot with a high-heeled spiked shoe. A culmination and confirmation of their tumultuous romance came during a restraining order hearing, 
when Shellfeffer proposed to Strom in front of a judge and she accepted. Even so, in February of 2014, the 33-year-old met up with a former classmate at a cafe in Warsaw. Strom offered intercourse and $1,000 to the 24-year-old would-be hitman. She told him to buy a gun off the street and to blow his brains out, in reference to her fiancé, even suggesting he use a potato as a suppressor. Unbeknownst to Strom, the man she'd approached about the killing was actually an informant for the local police department. He contacted the authorities and the woman was arrested. She claimed that the entire conversation was meant as a joke and a form of drunken venting but nonetheless accepted a plea for solicitation to commit first-degree intentional homicide. Strom would spend at least three and a half years in prison. She was also interviewed by the media and said that she still loved Shel Pfeffer and she would have never gone through with the murder plot. The targeted fiancé echoed the same sentiment, referring to the incident as Strom's mental drama and proposing that instead of prison, she be sent to a mental health facility. Number 6. Colton Barnes In July of 2020, a Nebraska man was arrested on charges of first-degree murder, animal cruelty, child abuse and tampering with evidence. Colton Barnes and Kayla Matulka had gotten engaged in March and were due to get married mid-fall. The nature of the domestic argument that occurred at their Malmo home remains unclear but at one point, Barnes was asked to leave the residence. By his own admission, he'd sent the victim a text message, which he then deleted from her phone, threatening to kick the door down. After regaining entrance to the home, Barnes forcefully and repeatedly stabbed his 27-year-old fiance and her dog, a black Labrador named Diesel, before fleeing the premises. Both succumbed to their extensive injuries. Batulka had two children to whom Barnes would have become a stepfather. The murder scene was discovered by the victim's 11-year-old son, who then ran to a nearby home and asked the neighbor for help, telling him that he thought his mother was dead. A 911 call was placed at around 9.30 a.m. Footage from a surveillance camera pointed to Barnes as the main suspect, and he was arrested a few hours later. Upon being taken into custody, he told the officers, I wish I could have stopped myself. He was held without bond at Saunders County Jail. In spite of the substantial evidence against him, Barnes pleaded not guilty. His trial is ongoing. Number 5. Dominic Evans In January of 2019, an English man allegedly fell asleep behind the wheel and crashed his car, resulting in the death of his fiancée, Kaylee Gill and Dominic Evans, both in their early 20s, had been together since their early teens and planned to get married the following year. The couple had two children who were in the back seat at the time of the crash. They'd just returned from a family holiday to Egypt and were traveling on the M5 near Columpton, Devon. Their Nissan Duke was seen veering across the motorway before crashing into a lorry. 22-year-old Gill was the only one to be extracted from the wreckage in critical condition, as Evans and the children hadn't suffered serious injuries. The young woman was taken to Derryford Hospital, where she passed away four days later. Evans, who reportedly had no memory of the accident, subsequently appeared at Exeter Crown Court, where he admitted to causing death by careless driving. He was given a 12-month driving ban and a jail sentence of eight months, suspended for two years. Number 4. Kendrick Akins In early January of 2020, just days after proposing to his girlfriend, a Houston man shot and killed her, following an argument about car issues. Kendrick Akins and Dominic Jefferson, both in their 30s, had been dating for about three months before he proposed to her on New Year's Eve. Jefferson and an unnamed woman were outside the couple's home and getting ready to pick up the latter's boyfriend from work. Jefferson's car wouldn't start and as Akins came outside to ask about the issue, his fiance shouted at him not to touch her car. In the rapidly escalating argument, Akins reached for his gun. According to eyewitness reports, his fiance dared him to shoot her. He then pointed the weapon at Jefferson's chest and fired a single round, killing her. A neighbor heard the gunshot and, as he approached the scene, encountered Jefferson, who fired once in his direction. The neighbor survived by diving into nearby bushes and playing dead, hoping that the shooter wouldn't return. Akins fled the scene after grabbing his fiancé's cell phone and was later arrested. He had two prior convictions in Harris County for aggravated assault and felon in possession of a weapon. Akins asked to be put in protective custody as the victim had brothers in the county jail and he feared retaliation. He was charged with murder and aggravated assault with a combined bond set at $225,000.
Number three, Philip Keller. In May of 2021, MMA fighter Philip Keller of Florida was arrested and charged with first degree premeditated murder after shooting his fiance while high on MDMA. 39 year old Keller was known in the MMA community after competing under the Titan FC banner, where he suffered three losses from 2019 to 2020. He'd called 911 at around 11 a.m. to report that his girlfriend, Alicia Red Campitelli, was not breathing and that someone had possibly broken into their apartment. 35-year-old Campitelli, a well-known local piercing artist, was already dead as first responders arrived at the scene. She had been shot twice and hours before Keller called 911, at least one resident reported hearing the sound of gunshots. Surveillance footage would show Keller making multiple withdrawals using Campitelli's debit card after he killed her. The fighter then called an acquaintance and shared details of the murder, including where he disposed of the gun. The acquaintance contacted investigators who set up a monitored phone call. Keller was recorded saying, I killed her bro, and went on to mention he was severely intoxicated at the time of the murder. After the authorities heard the confession and as deputies were closing in on Keller, he attempted to evade arrest by jumping into a creek on Merritt Island, but was ultimately taken into custody. Number two, Alexander Voronin. Mere days before their wedding, Russian man Alexander Voronin brutally murdered his fiance, 26-year-old Marina Pankratova. She had already bought her wedding dress and was prepared to spend the rest of her life with the same man who had violently ended. In 2020, the woman's half-naked body was found at the Moscow apartment they shared, where Voronin had subjected her to what was reported as a three-hour-long onslaught. Her face was disfigured and her skull was fractured by dozens of strikes with an unidentified object suspected to have been the blunt part of an axe. Her limbs were covered in wounds, some of which had been inflicted by punches and kicks. Voronin's mother was the one who discovered the gruesome killing. In the ensuing investigation, CCTV footage showed the 25-year-old beating Pankratova before they got home, and no one else was seen entering the apartment prior to him leaving it. The police interviewed five of the man's former partners, all of whom claimed he'd been abusive. One woman reported that in a fit of rage, he tied her to a chair and threatened to throw her child out the window. Voronin, a travel agent, had initially tried to flee abroad, but was prevented from leaving Russia by pandemic travel restrictions. He was persuaded to surrender by his father, Nikolay, an ex-KGB security service officer. Voronin, who in court claimed that he didn't remember anything, was ultimately sentenced to 14 and a half years in prison. Number 1. James Addy in 2018, the body of Molly Watson was found on a gravel road in Monroe County, Missouri. She'd been shot, execution style, in the back of the head. In April of that year, she was supposed to marry her fiancé, James Addy, whom she'd been dating for seven years. However, it would have been an illegal union as Addy, a man in his 50s, was still married to Melanie, his wife of 23 years with whom he shared a daughter. For years, he'd been living a double life and his family was completely unaware of his 35-year-old fiancé's existence. Then, as he became a murder suspect, his family man facade unraveled. A blood-spattered T-shirt was found at the scene, covered in Watson's DNA. It was an instrumental piece of evidence as Emma, Addie's daughter, told investigators that she'd made the T-shirt, effectively tying him to the killing. Tire marks at the scene matched Addie's vehicle, and an empty box of ammunition retrieved from the same area was identified by a firearms expert as matching ammo found in his home. During his trial, Addy, who maintained his innocence, put forward a story about an ex of Watson's who'd supposedly been stalking her and who could have been responsible for her death. No evidence was presented in support of his allegations. A prosecutor argued that Addy's actions destroyed two families, the family of his victim, Molly Watson, and his own. He was sentenced in July of 2021 to life in prison plus a decade. Number 9. Eduardo Arevalo In December of 2019, a teenager from the colony, Texas, was arrested for killing his older sister, who was eight months pregnant at the time. 19-year-old Eduardo Arevalo told officers that he'd strangled his sister, Viridiana, aged 23, when they were alone in the house. His confession came after the young woman's body was discovered in a neighborhood alley. 
Aravala reportedly told officers that it killed her because she was an embarrassment to her family. Viridiana struggled with depression, but was reportedly looking forward to becoming a mother. A suicide note was also found, but Aravalo confessed to writing it as well. According to him, he initially buried her body about an hour north of the colony, before moving it to the alley, which was roughly a mile from their home. Aravalo was charged with capital murder, but his oldest sibling didn't believe he'd done it, describing him as a kind and positive young man. Number 8. Elizaveta Dubravina in 2016, a Russian woman was accused of brutally murdering and mutilating her younger sister. 22-year-old Elizaveta Dobrovina was said to have been jealous of her model sister, 17-year-old Stefania, but would also reportedly try to emulate her image. They were believed to be close and both had spent time in orphanages as children. The killing took place at the St. Petersburg apartment of Stefania's 44-year-old alleged lover, Alexei Fatif while he'd gone out to buy some wine. It was reported that shortly before her death, Stefania had posed for nude photos to boost her modeling career. Friends denied rumors that she'd appeared in adult films or worked as an escort. While they were alone in the apartment, Elizaveta, in a drug and jealousy-fueled rage, attacked her sister. Stefania was stabbed 189 times, leaving her body unrecognizable. Elizaveta had also gouged her eyes out and cut off her ears. Fatih returned to a horrific scene and detained the woman until law enforcement arrived. Elizaveta would later accuse him of the murder, but police and prosecutors said the man wasn't under any suspicion. Elizaveta was charged with the killing and sent to a psychiatric facility until she'd be deemed fit to stand trial. Number 7. Kevon Watkins On February the 2nd of 2018, an argument over a Wi-Fi password resulted in the death of a 20-year-old woman from Mason, Georgia. 16-year-old Kevon Watkins had changed the Wi-Fi password so that he could play video games without his family slowing down the connection. A fight broke out between the teenager and his mother. His sister, Alexis, joined the argument, afraid that Kevon was going to become physical with their mother. Kevon and Alexis came to blows and the fight ended up on the ground. Kevon put his sister in a chokehold and threatened to beat their mother when she tried to break them up. Consequently, the woman called the police. Kevon only let go of his sister when ordered to do so by officers. By that time, he'd been choking her for upwards of 15 minutes. The woman was given CPR at the scene, but later that day was declared dead from asphyxiation at a local hospital. In the aftermath, Kevon was sentenced to life in prison. Number 6. Thomas Parkinson Freeman 23-year-old Thomas Parkinson Freeman accidentally shot his twin brother, Matthias, in October of 2020, after they were both irresponsibly handling firearms. Thomas, Matthias, and a friend, whose name wasn't released, were inside a Nissan Pathfinder parked in front of their home. As a joke, Matthias pulled out a gun on his twin. Thomas had formerly worked as a security officer and was wearing the gun belt from his previous job. He also brandished a gun but pulled the trigger as he pointed it towards his brother. Matthias was shot in the face and died at the scene. When questioned by the authorities, Thomas said that he wasn't acting in self-defense as he'd known Matthias wasn't actually going to shoot him. He had no idea why he'd squeezed the trigger but assumed it was a reflex from the training he'd previously received. Thomas, who had no prior criminal history, was charged with second-degree manslaughter. In late October of 2008, 46-year-old Edwin Hawes was attacked outside his home in Andover, Minnesota. The authorities found blood on the exterior of his house and on the undercarriage of his Volkswagen Passat, as well as a pool of blood in the driveway. The man's charred remains, identified by dental records, were discovered two days later at a farm owned by his 37-year-old brother, Andrew. For years, Edwin had been feuding with Andrew and their 43-year-old sister, Elizabeth. They had accused Edwin of embezzling funds from the family's landscaping business, while he had had restraining orders against both of them. Andrew was even charged with first-degree assault after reportedly trying to run his brother over and threatening to kill him. According to Elizabeth's husband, she and Andrew had openly talked about killing Edward in front of him, but claimed he didn't believe they'd be capable of doing so. The Volkswagen Passat, a company car, had become the latest object of violent bickering between Edwin and Andrew. 
the latter was driven by his fiance to Edwin's home, planning to repossess the vehicle, along with Elizabeth. It was there that Edwin was shot with a crossbow, struck in the head with a baseball bat and run over. The murder weapons, painted in matte black, were discovered at the scene. Someone had also tried to cover up the attack by clumsily pouring bleach on the concrete. The authorities went to investigate the bonfire reported at Andrew's Westbrook farm and had their suspicions that the siblings were somehow involved in Edwin's disappearance. Elizabeth was also at the scene and when questioned by the authorities, one of the first things she replied was, that's not my brother in there. Both siblings would later receive mandatory life sentences after Edwin's remains were retrieved and they were tied to the killing. One mystery, however, was never elucidated. Inside the fire pit, the police found a jawbone, an eye socket, and part of a lower leg that didn't belong to Edwin. Number 3. Robert Majika In August of 2018, Kevin Majika felt a foul smell coming from behind the family mobile home in Clinton Township, Michigan. He went inside a shed and found that the stench was coming from several garbage bags. He opened them and inside found the remains of his sister, 18-year-old Danielle Marjika and her boyfriend, 19-year-old Seren Bryan. The pair had been missing for several days. The investigators used blood detection spray and the double murder was traced back to the victim's other brother, Robert, aged 24. He'd bound Danielle and her boyfriend before using a hammer to crush their skulls. A medical examiner determined that they'd ultimately suffocated with garbage bags over their heads after Robert had disposed of them. A roll of tape and the hammer were also found inside the bags. The police tracked down Robert a few days later to Cincinnati. He was found wearing a hat, sunglasses and a long blonde wig. He was arrested and subsequently showed no remorse in court regarding the double murder. The judge would describe him as an evil man and he was sentenced to life without parole. Number 2. Estefani Loria In 2016, a fight between siblings escalated to murder in Washington Heights, New York City. 21-year-old Estefani Loria and her brother Jeffrey, who was two years younger, had been bickering in the early hours of the morning. Neighbors reported that they'd heard shouting, with each of the siblings telling the other to shut up. Their mother was vacationing in Mexico at the time. At a certain point, the argument turned physical and Jeffrey slapped Estefani across the face. Enraged, the young woman grabbed a kitchen knife and plunged it into his chest. The woman confessed to a responding NYPD officer at the door of the apartment. Jeffrey was rushed to Columbia University Medical Center, where he was later pronounced dead. It's unclear whether Estefani was charged with murder or manslaughter in the aftermath. In November of 2019, Texas woman Heidi Broussard gave birth to her daughter Margot. The woman and her baby then vanished without a trace a few weeks later, on December the 12th, after leaving their Austin home. Broussard's fiancé was the initial suspect, but then the authorities followed a lead that took them to the home of the woman's best friend, Magan Fiera Muska. Outside the residence, the police found Broussard's body in the trunk of a car registered in Fiera Muska's name. The investigation would later determine that she'd been strangled to death with a dog leash. Inside the home, the police found baby Margot, who was unhurt. Fiera Muska claimed that the child was hers. It was subsequently revealed that she'd pretended to be pregnant in the months leading up to Broussard's death, with the sinister intention of murdering her best friend and stealing her child. She'd even set a fake due date for December the 1st. Fiera Muska was arrested on charges that included capital murder, tampering with the corpse, and kidnapping. If she's found guilty, the woman faces the death penalty or a sentence of life in prison. Number 7. Cheyenne Rose Antoine a selfie posted on Facebook proved instrumental in the conviction of 21-year-old Cheyenne Rose Antoine for the 2015 murder of her best friend. In March of that year, the body of 18-year-old Brittany Gargoyle was found on the side of the road in Saskatoon, Canada. Antoine had initially told the police that she and her friend had gone out drinking and that she'd seen Gargoyle leave with an unknown man. However, security cam footage from a bar that Antoine claimed they'd visited showed they were never there. She tried to further cover her tracks through Facebook posts, asking her friend where she was and adding, hope you made it home safe. A break in the case came from one of Antoine's friends, who informed the police that she confessed to the killing that same night. 
The most important piece of evidence was eventually found on social media. A belt, which had been used by the attacker to fatally strangle Gargoyle, was discovered near her corpse. Roughly six hours before the body was found, a selfie featuring Antoine and Gargoyle had been posted on Facebook. In it, Antoine was wearing a belt that matched the one from the crime scene. The woman ultimately admitted that she'd killed her friend while drunk after a heated argument. She pled guilty to manslaughter and received a seven-year sentence. Number 6. Matthew Flame On November the 4th of 2018, in a park on Sydney's northern beaches, Matthew Flame beat his best friend to death while heavily intoxicated on MDMA. Flame, then in his early 20s, had been partying with 26-year-old Liam Anderson, son of famous Rose Tattoo frontman Gary Angry Anderson. In the early hours of the morning after reportedly taking a tenth MDMA capsule, Flame left the house in what was described as a state of mental distress. Anderson went after his friend. He caught up with Flame, who suffered a psychotic episode and saw him as a demonic entity that had come to take his life. Flame killed Anderson after striking him with his fists, his feet, and a rock. He was frothing at the mouth when confronted by police officers, as he believed they were demons too. He realized what he'd done a few hours later and maintained that he'd never intended to kill his friend. Flame would be diagnosed with treatment-resistant schizophrenia while in custody. His defense attributed the fervent attack to his pre-existing mental condition, while the prosecution argued the psychosis had been self-induced by the excessive consumption of drugs. One forensic psychiatrist agreed with the prosecution, noting that Flame hadn't suffered previous episodes and that his mental state improved once he'd sobered up. Other specialists argued that his schizophrenia, exacerbated by his drug use, was the root cause. Flame was ultimately found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to 80 years in prison. Number 5. Murder of Cynthia Hoffman in June of 2019, the body of 19-year-old Cynthia Hoffman was discovered on the banks of the Eklutna River in Anchorage, Alaska. Her head and hands had been bound with duct tape and she'd been killed via a gunshot to the back of the head. It was ultimately revealed that the murder had been orchestrated by Hoffman's best friend, 18-year-old Denali Bremer. She'd been tricked into doing so by 21-year-old Indiana man Darren Schilmiller. While talking to Bremer online, He'd been posing as a millionaire named Tyler. He offered Hoffman $9 million to kill someone, record it, and send him the video. Bremer enlisted the help of four of her friends, promising them a cut of the money she was expecting to receive for the killing. Hoffman, who was described by her family as having learning difficulties, was lured by the group to a rural hiking trail. On June the 2nd, it was there that Bremer was bound and executed. 16-year-old Caden McIntosh was named as the one to have delivered the fatal shot with a gun provided by Bremer. She subsequently sent a Snapchat of the killing to Schilmiller. The case is ongoing, but if found guilty, each of the accused faces up to 99 years in prison. Number 4. Edward Seleznev In 2002, Russian man Edward Seleznev was convicted of a double murder for which he spent 15 years in prison. Following his release, Seleznev who'd previously been homeless, was back to living on the streets and in the shelters of Arkhangelsk. In 2016, he killed one of his friends, with whom he'd shared a room at a homeless shelter. After stabbing his victim to death, he used an axe to dismember the body. Most of the remains he placed in garbage bags and threw in the Vologniste River, but some he kept. Zeleznev liquefied the flesh and slurped it down, as he had trouble consuming solids due to his lack of teeth. By March of 2018, one of Seleznev's drinking companions took him in at his apartment. Seleznev killed the man and cannibalized him in a similar manner to his 2016 victim. He continued to live in the apartment, and when the victim's relatives came by to look for him, the killer cannibal told them he'd moved to St. Petersburg for a job. The family was reluctant to accept Seleznev's story. The victim's father became suspicious after finding odd-looking unpackaged meat in the fridge. He then discovered a jacket with Seleznev's passport, even though he'd claimed having no identification on him. The family notified the police and Seleznev, who'd come to be known as the Arkhangel's cannibal, was arrested. After several interrogations, he confessed to having killed and eaten three of his friends over a two-year period. The victims were stabbed to death after they'd passed out from drinking. 
they were dismembered with an axe and partially cannibalized. As for his motives, Seleznev claimed he had a craving for human flesh and that he'd heard voices telling him to kill and eat his victims. In spite of his horrific statements, Zeleznev was deemed sane and thus fit to stand trial. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Number 3. Arandi Elizabeth Gutierrez Arandi Elizabeth Gutierrez and Anel Baez, both 16, were best friends who went to the same high school in Guamuchil, in the Sinaloa region of Western Mexico. In early 2014, Gutierrez and Baez had a falling out after the latter uploaded revealing photos of them to her Facebook. A tweet written by Gutierrez on an account which has since been deleted read, It may seem that I am very calm, but in my head I have killed you at least three times. She'd also reportedly told Baez she'd be lucky to survive until the end of the year. On March the 19th, Baez invited Gutierrez to her home in an attempt at reconciliation. While there, Gutierrez claimed that she needed to use the bathroom. Instead, she went into the kitchen and grabbed a knife. She then approached Baez from the back and stabbed her 65 times. Gutierrez fled the scene and Baez's family later found her lifeless body in a pool of blood. Gutierrez tried to keep up appearances and mourned with common friends. A week later, she attended Baez's funeral. It was there that the police took her into custody. She was sentenced as a minor to seven years in prison and released in September of 2017. Number 2. Brian Winchester In the years that followed his passing, in 2000, the death of Jerry Michael Williams was regarded as an accident. In December, the 31-year-old Florida man had left his home in Tallahassee to go duck hunting at Lake Seminole. He disappeared and was presumed to have drowned. When his body wasn't found, the authorities surmised that alligators had devoured his remains, which was false as they don't eat in the winter months. In the years that followed, Williams's widow, Denise, married his best friend, Brian Winchester. Their relationship eventually took a turn for the worse and Denise filed for divorce. Faced with the threat of losing his wife, Winchester kidnapped her at gunpoint, but later released her after she promised not to go to the police. The woman did, in fact, contact the authorities and Winchester faced 20 years in prison for kidnapping and domestic assault. Afraid that Denise might start talking about the past, he entered an immunity agreement with law enforcement for information regarding the death of Williams. Winchester revealed that he and Denise were having an affair at the time. He had lured Williams to the lake at her behest with an initial plan to stage a boating accident. When that failed, Winchester shot him. In 2017, Williams' body was discovered buried at the edge of the lake and it was concluded that he'd been killed via a shotgun blast to the face. Denise was arrested for the murder conspiracy and, in 2019, sentenced to life in prison. Number 1. Amy Sue Brown In February of 2018, Amanda Hill and Amy Sue Brown were celebrating the former's 36th birthday in a camper next to her home in Prosser, Washington State. Joining them were Hill's boyfriend and Brown's fiancé, Brandon Fayard. The couple shared drinks until midnight when Fayard claimed he was going to bed because he had to work the following day. Hill followed him inside, saying she had to use the restroom. As Brown went into the home, she found her best friend in bed with her fiancé. She flew into a fit of rage and a fight broke out between the two women. It culminated with Brown fatally shooting Hill twice in the torso. In court, Brown argued that she'd acted in self-defense but was ultimately found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Number 10. Leanne Bowman In May of 2021, Leanne Bowman was arrested for conspiring to have her ex-mother-in-law murdered. It's alleged that the realtor and powerboat racer of the Lake of Ozarks region in Missouri was in search of a hitman for her hated in-law and was willing to pay a sum of $1,500 for it to look like an accident. Bowman blamed her mother-in-law for her strained relationship with her daughters and believed that she would convince her ex-husband to take her to court for full custody of their kids. By finding a hitman, the perceived source of all her supposed problems could be resolved and she set out to make that happen. Bowman consulted a close friend for tips and leads to hiring a contract killer and even texted one of her daughters a cryptic message about their grandmother's death and plea to remain loyal to their real mother. She downplayed the text but was arrested just days later when her acquaintance gave her up to the police. 
There is an alleged recording of Bowman talking about her plans, but she vehemently countered the charges. Bowman claimed that she was goaded and betrayed while intoxicated. Bowman's ex-husband made his side clear by immediately filing a protective order against her. The man stated he'd suffered enough in the past 15 years, pointing to the woman's perception of being above the law as one of the sources of his grief. Number 9. Kenneth Parks and Barbara Woods In Canada, 1987, Kenneth Parks left his home in the middle of the night and drove over 12 miles to his in-law's house and tried to kill them both. He bludgeoned his mother-in-law to death with a tire iron first and then used his bare hands to try and choke his father-in-law. He then turned himself in and immediately confessed to his crimes. Parks was an avid gambler who had recently stolen money from his family. However, in spite of the police having a clear motive, as well as a surviving victim and a confession, he walked away a free man. Parks' defense stated that he'd fallen asleep watching TV. It was argued that he'd committed the crime and the confession all while unconscious and therefore couldn't be held accountable for his actions. Experts testified in support of his defense and the jury found him innocent, sparing him not only a life sentence, but a trip to a psychiatric hospital as well. The case was appealed all the way up to the Canadian Supreme Court, but his punishment remained unchanged and had essentially only amounted to a prescription for sleep medication. Number 8. Alexandra R. Bloodgood Alexandra R. Bloodgood was fatally shot in the back of the head on May the 17th of 2020 after her husband and his brother had gotten into a fight over laundry. Her brother-in-law, Shane Finnell, had come over and was in discussion with her husband when it turned violent. Finnell threw a potted plant and walked up behind the unassuming R. Bloodgood and shot her point-blank in the head. Faced with the reality of his actions, he immediately stumbled to the neighbor's yard muttering that he's done a horrible thing and urging them to call the police. He faced charges of second-degree murder and unlawful use of a weapon. Number 7. Nicole Montavo Mother of one, Nicole Montavo from St. Cloud, Florida, was killed in October of 2019 over custody of her 8-year-old son. A year prior, she had made a bid to distance herself from her husband, Christopher Otero Riviera, and his family after he was sent to jail for kidnapping and abusing her. While he was incarcerated, she divorced him and temporarily stopped allowing her in-laws to see their grandchild. Otero Rivera and his father, Angel Rivera, were enraged by this and wanted to make her disappear to get full custody. They weren't at all subtle regarding their intentions, and neighbors testified that for over a year, they would tell anyone that listened how they wanted Montavo dead. Rivera offered bribes of up to $10,000 for her disappearance and contacted his son's former cellmate, to bribe him into planting drugs in her car, but no one would do it for them. Her body was eventually discovered buried over two separate Rivera properties. It had been burned and crudely dismembered. Her father-in-law and her ex-husband were convicted on all charges related to second-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and abuse of a human body. Both were sentenced to life in prison. Number 6. Gordon Ramsay Celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay has had a tumultuous past with his in-laws. In 2017, Gordon Ramsay sent his father-in-law and both his brothers-in-law to prison, and it had taken him nearly six years to get them charged. The dispute first started back in 2011, when Gordon Ramsay fired his father-in-law, Chris Hutchison, as CEO of his empire. The sacking spouted a very public battle between the two in which Ramsay published an open letter claiming Hutchison ran the company like a dictator yet pleaded with his mother-in-law to not cut ties with his wife and children, who had threatened to sue. There was a subsequent legal battle and Ramsay accused his father-in-law of conspiring with his brothers-in-law to hack into his emails and gain access to personal and legal information. He employed both brothers in IT who were able to breach into what was deemed his personal property rights 828 times over a five-month period. The mastermind Ramsay's father-in-law got the heaviest sentence at six months. In the middle of winter in Berlin 2015, a husband and his parents decided to team up with an Islamic miracle healer to perform an exorcism on his wife as a cure for her infertility. The 22-year-old victim, identified as Nesma M, was forced by her husband and in-laws to drink excessive amounts of a salt water concoction 
in the hope of expelling supposed demons from her body. The exorcism would prove extremely detrimental to her health and she died in hospital only a week later due to pulmonary embolisms and excess fluid in the brain. In 2020, over four and a half years after her death, German authorities finally officially arrested her husband and in-laws on the charge of causing bodily harm resulting in death. Number 3. Jason Corbett On August the 2nd of 2015, native Irishman and father of two, Jason Corbett, was found murdered in his home in Lexington, North Carolina. His wife and his father-in-law admitted to bludgeoning him to death but pleaded it had been in self-defense. Ex-FBI agent and father-in-law to the victim, Tom Martins, alleged that while he was spending the night at his daughter's house, he heard a commotion coming from upstairs and found Corbett strangling his daughter. Prosecution and defense agreed on the following course of action. Martin used an aluminium baseball bat to beat Corbett while his daughter hit him across the head with a cement brick, conveniently left in the bedroom. Martins and his daughter Molly Corbett were convicted of second-degree murder in 2017, largely based on the distinct lack of any self-defense injuries on their bodies. Yet, in 2021, an appeal for another trial was granted on the basis of new evidence. Corbett's daughter, who was eight at the time of his murder, has strongly spoken out against this decision. Number 2. Shane Jeffrey Barker On August 3rd of 2009, along with very few other clues, Shane Jeffrey Barker's body was found with four fatal gunshot wounds at his home in Tasmania. Authorities offered a $250,000 reward for any information, but within such a tight-knit community, no one came forward. Eleven years later, the cold case finally got a chance at closure, with the arrest of his parents-in-law, Cedric Harper Jordan and Nolene June Jordan. The 38-year-old victim had previously been married to their daughter and even shared a child with her. But police didn't suspect the woman's involvement. Barker's heartbroken father died before finding those involved with his son's murder. The rest of his family will wait with bated breath at the upcoming trial. Number 1. Surjit Athwal Surjit Athwal was lured from her home in West London and across two continents to India by her mother-in-law, where she was drugged, murdered and dumped in a river in December of 1998. Surjit had suffered non-stop abuse from her husband and mother-in-law ever since the start of her 10-year-long arranged marriage. Moving in with her husband's family at the tender age of 16, Surjit's mother-in-law, Bakan Kaur Athwal, began a reign of terror in which she controlled what she wore and said, limited her access to her friends and family, dictated how to raise her child and encouraged her son to physically discipline her. Surjit's sister had also married into the family to another brother. Over the years, both sisters were treated like slaves and live-in maids. When Surjit became pregnant with her second child, she made a desperate attempt to escape her in-laws by fleeing their house and filing for divorce, but eventually returned and bore them a long-desired son. Nonetheless, Bakan saw Surjit as nothing more than a smear of shame on the family and devised a plot to get rid of her, even telling Surjit's sister of the plan. Bakan convinced Surjit to join her on a trip to India but never brought her back. Surjit's sister was threatened into submission and it wasn't until 2004 that she mustered up the courage to reveal the truth. She went into hiding and, within two years, Bakan and her son were convicted on murder charges. It marked the first time in a British court that someone was convicted of an honor killing outside of the UK. Number 9. Daria Alyabayeva During lockdown in April of 2020, a New York woman stabbed her roommate after she reportedly criticized her drinking habits. 31-year-old Tatiana Nazaranova and Daria Alyabayeva, four years her junior, lived together in an Upper East Side apartment. Nazarinova, who owned the home, had been helping Alabayeva get established in the city. Years prior, they'd lived together in California, but had fallen out over the latter's drinking. Nazarinova still felt that they should look out for each other, since they were both Russian. Yet before long, Alabayeva's drinking again put a strain on their relationship. Nazarinova tried to get her to sober up by banning drinking in the shared areas. On April the 19th, she found a whiskey glass in the living room and poured it down the sink. This enraged Alibayeva to the point that she grabbed the kitchen knife and started stabbing the woman, 
whom she'd referred to in the past as her best friend. Nazarinova sustained cuts and puncture wounds to her torso, shoulder, arms, hands, and face. She even reportedly saw a piece of intestine sticking out of her abdomen. As she lay bleeding, Nazarinova feared she was going to die and begged her attacker to call the police. Alibaeva refused to do so and abandoned her. The victim managed to call for help on her cell phone and was taken to a hospital where doctors saved her life. Nine days after the attack, Alibaeva was arrested for attempted murder and imprisoned at Rikers Island. Number 8. Joe Shellin in December of 2018, an American woman was brutally murdered by her roommate at a student complex in the Netherlands. 21-year-old Sarah Pappenheim from Minnesota had met Joe Schellin, aged 23, while studying at an Erasmus University in Eindhoven. They formed a connection through a shared interest in music, became friends and eventually moved in together. Schellin was withdrawn and Pappenheim would refer to herself as his only friend. After about a year and a half of them living in the apartment, Schellin started exhibiting anger and intense mood swings. In the days leading up to Pappenheim's murder, he reportedly confessed to her that he was going to kill three people. She was concerned and contacted aid workers, who talked to Schellin but saw no immediate reason to intervene. On December the 12th, a few days before Pappenheim was supposed to return to Minnesota for Christmas, police were called to the apartment. They found the young woman in severe condition, as she'd been stabbed and cut numerous times. Efforts to save her proved fruitless, and she bled to death in the apartment. Following his arrest, Schelling confessed to killing Pappenheim, but said that all he remembered about the incident was being angry with her. Specialists found that the man had lost touch with reality due to a combination of psychosis, autism, and schizophrenia. He was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to six years in prison and institutionalized psychiatric treatment. Number 7. Anthony Mendez In February of 2020, a Florida man accidentally shot his roommate while playing with a firearm. According to the police, who responded to the call in Kissimmee, 23-year-old Anthony Mendez was irresponsibly handling his weapon in the apartment he shared with Savannah Lee threats. It discharged and his roommate sustained a critical gunshot wound Threats was already dead by the time police arrived on the premises. Mendez was charged with manslaughter, violation of probation, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. The nature of the man's priors is unclear, but considering the charges brought against him, he faced multiple years in prison. Number 6. Justin Van Kirk A 35-year-old Pennsylvania man beat his roommate to death in 2016. Following the dispute over stolen beer, Justin Van Kirk accused Charles Parker, his 58-year-old roommate, of taking some of his Keystone Ice beers without asking. Both men were described by neighbors as heavy drinkers. A fight broke out in Parker's bedroom, and the older man was punched several times in the face and head. Parker started to bleed from his mouth, and Van Kirk, who reportedly didn't want his roommate's blood to stain the carpet, dragged him to the living room floor. Van Kirk left him there and went to bed. He called 911 the following day when upon returning home in the afternoon, found that Parker was still on the floor and no longer breathing. The man was pronounced dead at the scene, exhibiting bruising, swelling, and severe injuries to the back of the head. Van Kirk was ultimately found guilty of involuntary manslaughter and sentenced to house arrest and probation. Number 5. Zachary Penton in August of 2016, 21-year-old Zachary Penton fatally shot his roommate in the Arizona home they were sharing. The victim was 41-year-old Daniel Garofalo. Based on his past social media posts, Penton had reportedly developed a firearm obsession. In June, in one of his Twitter posts, Penton expressed surprise at how easy it had been for him to purchase a gun. Two days before he shot Garofalo in one of his tweets, Penton claimed, that he needed to move out before he viciously murdered his roommate. According to Penton's account of the shooting, Garofalo had burst into his room asking him to move out. The man then reportedly tackled him and took away his phone, which Penton claimed had caused him to fear for his safety. He reached under his pillow, pulled out a semi-automatic handgun and shot him dead. Penton's legal representation argued self-defense and claimed that the tweets weren't an indication of premeditation, 
Penton eventually pled down to manslaughter from second-degree murder charges and was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Number 4. Ricardo Medina Jr. In 2015, an actor best known for his role as one of the Power Rangers fatally stabbed his roommate with a Conan the Barbarian type sword. Back in 2002, Ricardo Medina Jr. played Cole Evans, the Red Wild Force Ranger, on the popular series. Medina's career never really achieved mainstream success beyond the role and, in 2015, he was living in Green Valley, California, with roommate Joshua Sutter. On February the 1st, Medina and Sutter, both in their late 30s at the time, got into an argument involving Medina's girlfriend. After the men had come to blows, Medina and his girlfriend retreated to his bedroom. Sutter allegedly broke through the door and it was then that Medina picked up the double-edged sword. He used the weapon to stab Sutter, who died of his injuries after arriving at the hospital. Medina ultimately pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter and was given a six-year sentence. Number 3. James Hugo in 2014, a Tampa man was charged with manslaughter after beating his roommate to death following an argument involving a chicken foot. After staying at a homeless shelter, Benjamin Calderon moved in with James Hugo. Calderon hoped to work as an armed security officer and was saving money for a license. The men, both in their 50s, had gotten along at first. Then on February the 15th, Calderon grabbed a chicken foot from a skillet where Hugo was cooking. Furious. Hugo started relentlessly pummeling him with his fists. Calderon sustained severe trauma and succumbed to internal bleeding. Hugo confessed to beating his roommate to death following his arrest and was charged with manslaughter. Florida police records revealed he'd been arrested 19 times in the past. Calderon's brother, who was deeply affected by the incident, told a media outlet that no one deserves to die over a chicken foot before becoming one of the most notorious serial killers in U.S. history. Jeffrey Dahmer enlisted in the U.S. Army and trained as a medical specialist. By the time he'd joined the military, Dahmer had already killed a man in Ohio and openly boasted about it when drunk. But his fellow soldiers didn't believe him. From 1979 to 1981, he was stationed in West Germany and his roommate at the time was Billy Capshaw. Years later, Capshaw would detail the nightmarish time he spent with Dahmer while describing him as a sociopath, a psychopath, and a narcissist. Soon after they'd started living together, Dharma began to completely control Capshaw. He beat and tortured him. He'd strike him across the joints with a metal bar from a bed apparatus. Capshaw learned not to scream or cry during the abuse, as it only made Dharma hit him harder. He wasn't taken seriously by his superiors whenever he tried to complain. Capshaw was repeatedly drugged and tied to the bed while Dharma controlled the only key to the room. Capshaw stated that he wanted to kill Dharma in his sleep and then take his own life. He subsequently regretted not having killed him. In light of the monster he would become, Dharma was discharged from the military in 1981 due to his alcohol abuse. A few years later, he began his killing spree, claiming at least 16 victims with many of his later murders involving cannibalism and body parts being preserved as trophies. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be the victim of a non lethal honey trap scheme or be trapped in a room with 100 angry bees? Let us know in the comments section below.